was really just start with um, a, a quick overview of the issue. And not that you all don't understand what's going on, because I think more than most that you do. But um, last month, I was asked to speak to meet with the House Democratic Caucus in D.C. at the Capitol, and they asked for some slides. And since then, I found it a really helpful way of kind of framing the conversation. I'm just I just want to be clear that, you know, that we are in a battle for the future of public education and that there is misinformation and uh, that they're by the far right and attacks on public schools. This is me. That's the book. Um, and just, you know, the book is super short and I made it that way just so that um, the point of it is really to connect the dots so that when people say things about social emotional learning or, um, you know, you know, SEL, what is it? It's in there. Um, so it's really meant to, as a, it's not a handbook, but it's a story, storybook. Um, so couldn't resist, went to the Capitol, um, and this, and this was the meeting room. And I guess one of the hopeful things that I'd like to share first off is that I was told, you know, I, I didn't know what to expect. People might be wandering in and out. But what I found was a standing room only packed room of people with a lot of questions who are our you know, Democratic uh, House members. So why do public schools matter? Let's not forget that. I mean, John Dewey insisted that the training of de you know, Democratic citizens, it wasn't the courses you were taking, it wasn't your civics class, it was the experience of going to school with people who are not the same as you, and learning to work and learn beside them. And I think one of the things that we need to keep focus on is the fact that about 90% of kids in America attend public schools. In 1986, 70% were white. In 2020, 47% were white. So our, the demographics of public schools have changed and we need to include everyone. So the idea that inclusion is this political issue baffles me because we need everyone to get educated, to learn and to be productive members of our society. So top level ideas, there is, you're not seeing things, there is a concerted far right attack on public education. And these are well-funded legacy groups like the Heritage Foundation, the Leadership Institute, the Goldwater Institute. I mean, there are a whole host of them. And there are other education-based orgs like, you know, Parents Defending Education and Moms for Liberty, which you've probably heard of. And the 1776 Project now, um, you know, has a super PAC. So, I, you know, one of my um, conversation partners in Connecticut only realized belatedly, she said after reading the book, that Parents Defending Education, that those were the people who were showing up on the ground in Connecticut. Um, these attacks aren't new but the internet and social media are bringing speed and spread. And that's why we are all so exhausted, I think. Um, so what's the hopeful part of this story is that school moms on the ground are pushing back and, I, and they're being connected in events like this and through Red Wine and Blue, which has great resources. So how do we spot attacks? Local school board policies, we, uh, we've heard about book bans, curricular challenges, all of these kinds of things. School boards don't necessarily have to take on these tasks. They can just, you know, approve textbooks and make bus routes and do budgets. But increasingly, when you have these activist school boards, they will dip their hands into these um, areas. And you can see them, you know, arguments about what to hang on classroom walls. You'll see them target individuals. I've interviewed librarians for my book who, you know, left because they got so many freedom of information requests. Um, there will be campaigns to fire educators, social media attacks. We also see um, increasingly legislative actions, and we see state laws and you know banning and censoring materials. And you'll notice. Each, each legislative session each year seems to have its own kind of theme. I think this is the, a big voucher year. A couple of years ago, we were criminalizing um, uh, librarians that had quote unquote obscene materials in the libraries. And the reason why this is happening in this way is that you have groups like ALEC and you have people creating quote unquote model legislation 
And then legislators in different states just pick it up, paste it, cut and paste, and they have proposals for their state. And I've been told that sometimes they even forget to change the name of the state. Um, so when I was in uh, visiting uh, the house in, in the Capitol, they were, people were very interested in parental rights and wanted to understand why this has become such a hot issue. And I think it's important to recognize that the, what they're doing is they're framing the opposition to schools as asserting or protecting parental fight, rights. And it feeds a false narrative that schools are harming children um, and that we need laws, which we don't need because parents already have rights um, to ensure student safety. And the phrasing of this um, really dates to the late 1970s, early 80s, if we look back to Jerry Falwell. And you know, before that, there was a lot of emphasis religiously on just kind of um, putting God back in school. Um, but then people wised up, the religious right wised up and recognized that what they could do instead was use secular language. And instead of calling for putting God in school, it became the students' rights to pray. And then you see parental rights. And I noticed it um, particularly in the, we're seeing sex ed becoming a target again, but I wrote about that um, in the early 1990s after, um, you know, during the AIDS crisis, there was a need to revise sex education curricula and include words like homosexuality and condom. And the opposition to that was very often painted um, as, as asserting parental rights to not have their children exposed to that. Um, so I think what's already important, what's really the top line message is that parents have rights. And I think even more important than that, you have influence over your kids. I, I mean, uh, the power of parental involvement and influence is so much greater than any legal right. Um, so who are the school moms? They are you guys. They are the people who are building grassroots groups, organized, motivated, networked, sharing power, sharing information, and they are, you are all critical in 2024. Um, and those are some of the groups, and I've met a number of people around the country as I've been talking about this book and doing the reporting for it and doing my own reporting. But what's really important is that we hear a lot about what's happening at the top of the ticket in 2024, but critical, critical, is um, the organizing on the ground because that's all about turnout. We can talk more about that. Um, so here's a fun little thing that I just wanted to share. And that's the Heritage Foundation, conservative you know, organization, several years ago was concerned about indoctrination. And so they, they um, commissioned a nationally representative survey to see if indeed K-12 educators who tended to be left-leaning were actually, um, you, you know, applying their personal views in the classroom. And you can see the quote at the bottom that they find little evidence that this is so. So I think that's a nice little factoid. Well, thank you for that, for the short overview. Uh, I'm actually really excited to read, to read your book. I've seen snippets, so I'm going to, I want to read the whole thing. And you're in uh, it. I, I am in it. You guys, I'm quoted. It was actually pretty cool to see my, my own quotes in a book. Uh, and I was really excited to see Red, Wine, and Blue and, and all the work that everybody on this call is doing highlighted. So you said one thing that I loved. You said how everyone's like, there's a lot of focus at the top of the ticket, but local organizing is where it's at. And I 100% agree with you. And I can share Red, Wine, and Blue's theory, you know, is that if we organize at the local level, um, you know, that actually translates up ticket because people tend to vote the top of the ticket and stop. Um, but we want them to vote because those local races are so important. You can use your voice. People aren't polarized around local. They don't even know who their school board candidates are. Um, well, so you those conversations. Is that what you found? Do you feel that people, the local organizing does influence, you know, the top of the ticket and all the way up? Well, I've, I found a couple of different things. And the first, and I'm going to hit it from the other end. So when I went to the first Moms for Liberty Summit in uh, Tampa in July 2022, and just to set the scene a little bit, um, I registered under my name, um, but I did dress to fit in. I brought a red blazer. I had a little American flag pin pinched into my lapel. 
I wore, you know, red, white, and blue, you know, and I went and I registered at the Marriott. And as I was registering, uh, the clerk said, whispered and said, I'm with you. I'm upgrading you all. And I was like, wow. And suddenly I found myself on a high floor with a water view. But one of the most curious things was that at the same time in July in Tampa, July 2022, right kitty corner to the hotel was uh, the Tampa Convention Center. And they were hosting Metricon, which was being billed as Florida's largest anime gathering. So into this surreal world that I've stepped, I am treated to people wearing horns and glitter and colonial garb. And it was just a real, it was a real treat, but also a reminder of how surreal. But to get to your question about the top of the ticket and the bottom of the ticket, when I was sitting in that ballroom um, and Ron DeSantis was one of the first speakers, he made a point of saying, I am going to endorse 30 school board candidates. Never been done before. I'm doing it. And there were a lot of moms, mostly moms there, 500 people in the room, and many of them were running for school board. And they were repeatedly asked to stand up and be recognized. And what I saw was that they were really proud of being endorsed by Ron DeSantis. And yet when I look at the situation, it was exactly the opposite that was true. What was happening was that Ron DeSantis was ensuring himself a ground army of volunteers who were moms. And when moms are get so busy with their own business and what they're doing, they forget the power that they possess. And that power that Ron DeSantis recognized is what the power that the moms, moms have up and down the ticket. On the other hand, the reason why showing up matters is that one of the things I did do is I wrote about a number of school board races, including in uh, North Texas. And uh, in North Texas, there were 11, this was a big experiment by Patriot Mobile, Christian cell phone company that, in, that donates 5% of its earnings to, uh, profits rather, to far-right causes, the NRA, anti-abortion groups, and they, in January 2022, saw an opportunity and created a super PAC. They spent over $400,000 on 11 hand-picked candidates with money filtered through local PACs that they helped you know, spur the creation of. And those 11 school board candidates won. And what they did is the money got spent at Axiom Strategies in Kansas City, Missouri, which is one of the places, which so happened to be the campaign strategist for Ron DeSantis, Ted Cruz, Glenn Youngkin. So suddenly you had big money and you had national strategists who were involved in 11 local school board races that flipped four school district boards. And why does that matter? Well, turnout in a couple of those races was 8%, 10%. So you, they essentially bought name recognition. So being on the ground, getting people out, getting them to vote, let, getting them to understand what's at stake really, really matters. So you mentioned earlier when you were doing the slides, Alec, and I'm not sure everybody knows what Alec is. So you might want to explain that for them. But could you explain, can you just kind of lay that out a little bit with that example, but how very, very coordinated these organizations are? Like what did the Heritage Foundation and Alec, and um, if, if you can kind of explain to people in the audience, like how these groups coordinate and how what we see happening, you know, at the local school board is, or the state legislature or whatever it is, is um, all these attacks that this is not just an organic thing that happens because a parent gets mad in the district, that this is a very well-coordinated. Um, well-coordinated, well-funded. <laughs> well-funded. Exactly. So, I mean, I'll just, I'll just do it visually, right? So my first Moms for Liberty Summit, I noticed that the Leadership Institute was the main sponsor. 
So I went to um, some of the sessions that the Leadership Institute organized. I also, as a journalist, looked at their 990 forms and noticed that between 2017 and 2021, that their annual donations had more than doubled to $39 million, which then made sense to me when I was sitting in a session and they were offering to send trainers for local, for people who wanted to run for school board anywhere in the country for free. So they were ready to go and be there. What I found also very interesting was that when I went to the second Moms for Liberty Summit in Philadelphia last July, the Leadership Institute was still there, but the lead sponsor was now Patriot Mobile. And Patriot Mobile is very well connected also to um, uh, Donald Trump and his, you know, his sons. And suddenly we had five Republican presidential candidates who were speakers at the convention. And you had Lee Wamsgon, who is the executive director of Patriot Mobile Action, the PAC, introducing Donald Trump. Um, interestingly, when I was at that first summit, the lead, the I was talking on at one of the tables outside to the Noah Webster Institute um, leader, who was had just discovered that school boards and moms were a real opportunity and had organized an online training. That a month later, the Leadership Institute started their online school board training, and we also know that the Leadership Institute then went ahead and opened an on the ground um, leadership uh, school board training institute that had been headed by Bridget Ziegler, um, but not any longer um, in Sarasota, Florida. So you see that everyone has recognized, you know, this is the thing, women's labor is underappreciated. And suddenly all of these groups are recognizing that there is real value in involving women and involving moms in these issues. And they are spending a lot of money and they have a lot of money. And one of the things that I do regularly is if some group looks really interesting, I go look and see who's on the board and who's on the advising committee. For example, if you go look at, at Black Minds Matter, right? That looks like an organic grassroots black led charter school organization, advocacy organization. And yet drill down and you find out that it's part of a Betsy DeVos organization. So it really, really, um, it ma these places are so well connected. They're so well aligned. And one of the things that I think um, came out of the Moms for Liberty uh, summit was that the language the kind of language that they framed, the arguments they framed, the casting of social emotional learning as a form of you know, Marxist indoctrination, which is patently absurd. There's no relationship. And yet the language, the money, they're all of these groups. I mean, if you go onto some of these sites, you see hammer and sickle. You know, For a while, Parents Defending Education, I think that was the group, there was a whole thing where they were tracking kind of Marxism around the country. So it's, it's, they, they're sharing language, they're sharing money, they're sharing resources, they're sharing strategy. Um, and these, and, and, you know, Moms for Liberty was very effective in helping to alert a lot of people who had been trying for years to make inroads um, into, uh, you know, kind of local communities. And they, you know, Moms for Liberty kind of showed the way, even if there's, you know, they seem to be struggling now, but their framing was really effective and we have to pay attention to that. I find it interesting because what we see, and I'm sure many women on this call see, is that in their communities, it's not like their neighbor who's going to the school board and raising these issues. Like it's these coordinated groups who are finding people and bringing them in. Um, is that what you see consistently around the country is that it's not really organically starting in that community? Absolutely. I mean, I did a story that was for Heckinger Report and that was in Vanity Fair in December where I spent six months in North Idaho. 
And there is no Moms for Liberty in North Idaho. Um, and what you're seeing is a nationalization of local issues. And this was a perfect example of that. There was a, a far right takeover of the school board. And what they what the result was, was that they didn't pass a levy, which in Idaho, which is, I think, the last in, in the country in, in funding, they had they, they, they lost a third of their school budget. They had um, adopted unanimously a social a, a, um, a English language arts curriculum. And yet when it arrived, because Sesame Street Workshop was involved and it had social emotional learning, a, they created a petition and had it rescinded. So I was there as they were entering their second year of school with no English language arts curriculum. The concept, so the consequences of this of the political um, activism are, are, are real on kids. But what was really, really interesting and I think it offers an opportunity and insight for everyone is that the people who fought to recall two of the far right board members were mostly Republican conservative religious moms who wanted public education in their district to actually work. And they successfully recalled two of the school board uh, members, replaced them, and then I was there on election day when there were three more open seats. And I stood out you know, on dirt roads outside of Masonic temples where voting places were, 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 ha where voting was happening. And I heard some of the far right uh, campaign workers talking to people, telling them that their candidate was going to keep boys out of girls' bathrooms. We're seeing this national language just grafted on to local debates. And I think that presents an opportunity for people to say, well, hold on, wait a minute here. This isn't, this isn't really what's going on here. Let's focus on what's going on in our district rather than grafting these national fear campaigns and, and you know, just embracing that rhetoric. So knowing, and we say this all the time, that we are actually the majority because this is the national well-funded right-wing group swooping in, like you said, grafting their messaging on to places. So your book's all about moms fighting back. So, you know, our theory, of course, is that when moms organize and for common sense, we win. Um, and is that, I know that's kind of the theme of your book, but maybe you could kind of share what you saw across the country when the local parents actually did stand up to this. Yes. So a couple of things. First of all, Julie, one of the things you said to me has long stuck in my head as a just a beautiful observation. And that was that, ma, you know, activists tend to be friends with other activists, but that moms know everybody. And I think back to the number of times I stood on the sideline of soccer soccer games, just chat. I mean, what else? I mean, you can only watch, yes, we can watch our children play, or I used to call it prancing when it seemed like they were pretending to play, but not really playing. But I mean, those conversations, those networks are real and they matter um, because we are all there for the good of our children. And that's what I, the foundation, what we have to remember is that public schools really didn't used to be these hyper-partisan places. I, when I went to public school, when I was a PTO mom, I did not know what anyone's politics were. I didn't care and it did not matter. So, I mean, the, 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 the connections that moms have on the ground are incredibly, incredibly organic and important. Um, so, I, I mean, I, I think that's an essential. In terms of fighting back, one of the things that I've been thinking about a lot is I look at Central Bucks and I look at, um, and you should go to their website, Advocates for Inclusive Education, um, Kate Nazemi and her, and uh, she's a co-founder of that group. And what I appreciate that um, it's been a, a lot of work, but keeping people informed after every school board meeting, before every school board meeting, a call to action, an explanation of what's happening, you know, really very objectively done, not with, you know, a lot of drama. And then she said something to me, I was in Doylestown a couple of weeks ago, 
And she said something that has just really stuck with me. And she said, um, she's gathering people across the political spectrum for kind of community events to remind people about, you know, the fact that we're all in this together. And she said, rather than fighting with the language, she observed that everyone agrees, pretty much agrees that you have the right to be who you say you are. I think it's a very neutral and powerful beginning point. And as I've been thinking more and more about this 2024 race and what I see from moms on the ground, moms are well poised to offer calm and kindness. I mean, Kate talks about how they have a band book club and then they also send everybody home with cookies. And I, I think that those things, there's a lot of anger and a lot of screaming. And I think this presents an opportunity to remind people of what they really enjoyed about public education and the community of public education. I 100% agree. And I saw my I saw my team dropping links to that group in the chat because uh, oh. I, I saw uh, nodding heads from my team. So they are well aware. Um, we we have some on the call I know who lives in Bucks. So she was shaking her head as you were <laughs> as you were going over that. So let's talk a little bit about this though. It's doing this organizing, fighting these fights is hard work. Um, it can be really exhausting. So what did you learn in talking from parents across the country about how they exercise self-care or protected their mental health? Like what what are people doing if they want to stay and you know fight the good fight? Yeah, I mean, I have heard a lot about how exhausting this is. And I I I absolutely feel it myself, um, even though I'm not on the front lines. I'm just watching all of you on the front lines and writing about it. Um, it is, on, on the flip side, I will also say that I have talked to a lot of people who are finding a tremendous sense of purpose and con connection in doing this work. So, um, we all have times in our lives where stepping up matters, where it, where what we do is consequential. And I think this is one of those times. So yes, we do have to step back, retreat, take a break, take a breath. We each have ways of doing it, exercise, you know, watching movies, you know, what, whatever it is, reading books. Um, we do have to do that. Um, on the other hand, the reason we have to do it is because we are needed now. I mean, it may not matter five years from now. Um, it may not have mattered 10 or 20 years ago, but it matters now that we are in this because this year is going to be huge. And, um, you know, moms have always organized and I, I also have this weird theory that when we care and do kind things for other people, it grow. It, it also serves us. So it's like a, you know, I don't know, pay it forward is kind of a cliche. But when I think when we are when we present our kindest selves, um, it it also brings it back to us. And I think that, you know, I keep thinking about. Um, I was reading. I just read a piece in the Atlantic this afternoon um, by David Frum about Trump, and how he was going to lose because it's all about him and he's so angry and he, you know, evoked Ronald Reagan. And I mean, I keep thinking of, you know, I, I happen not to have voted for Ronald Reagan, um, but what Reagan did do is he offered the sense of hope. I mean, his theme was it's morning in America. And I think that the way to, you know, win, um, win back trust in our schools, trust in one another is to present um, a really positive message um, because I think people are tired of hate and anger and um, but to do that we do have to care for one another and ourselves. So for anybody who's on here listening maybe there's some rumors or things flying in their district they start seeing things are happening or there are things happening or they just want to be prepared based on all of the conversations you've had with moms organizing across the country, you know, what advice would you have for somebody who's maybe just getting started in this? Um, 
don't, so don't care what, I mean, it's like Taylor Swift, right? Let the haters hate. They're going to do it. Don't, don't just let that stuff roll. Don't, don't be, um, don't be swayed by it. I think when we have purpose, when we know what we're doing and why we're doing it, it becomes very easy to step up and to do things at the moms for Liberty summit. That first summit was a, a, a big persuasion effort to tell these 500 moms who we heard repeatedly in that um, ballroom were not used to stepping out and, and being um, visible, running for office, speaking up at school board meetings, but they were being told that their children were in danger. And what do moms do when their children are in danger? They step up and protect them. So there, it, it's a, was a very negative emotional plea and I would argue that what we need is a really positive emotional plea, is that let us counter that, let us create senses of community. We don't let somebody take our community from us. Our, I mean, that sense of walking down the hallway in your public school and, you, and a kid that you know waves at you when you're helping out or something, I mean, that's powerful. You, it, it's like the kid, you get that sense of their heart feeling full, that they are part of something that is beyond that moment and that location, that they are part of this community. Um, I mean, if you look at who are who, who are your close friends, I mean, I can tell you that my closest friends in the world are people I met from my kids' schools, right? I mean, those are the people that um, that I'm in touch with, that I'm friends with. And we have to not poison that. Um, so I think, and moms are very good at knowing BS and being able to, to push it aside. I 100% agree with you. And we're all about the messaging at Red, Wine, and Blue. And we do want it to be positive. You want reasons for people to come together and be supportive and not, they're trying to divide and be chaotic. We want to be the common sense type, you know, we want that kind of messaging. And by the way, um, we're going to have a Really great messaging training. I just set the day, I think it's in May, all about how to counter parents' rights. So um, look for that to come out. But um, can you just uh, also just explain to people like where, if they're getting started, I mean, Red, Wine, Blue, obviously we have a lot of yeah. information, but where, uh, what other resources or, you know, where would you suggest people go to kind of get more information, read your well, book? I Obviously. Yeah, I, I actually, I, I mean, I, I obviously read the book, <laughs> but I think that there, I mean, like case group, um, um, parent, uh, I mean, there are a lot of parent groups all around the country that are doing really good work, um, uh, you know, and, and they're, and they're local and many of them have just figured it out on their own. Um, you know, just what I would say is that moms are great at networking, organizing, promoting, connecting to one another. I mean, this is not that different than a teacher appreciation breakfast, except it doesn't end, right? <laughs> You're still, um, and I think one of the things that I've seen real, that work really well with, with certain organizations is, is that women share power. And I know that's a gross sexist generalization, but I see it over and over again. Sharing power, sharing credit, working shoulder to shoulder is really important. So find the people, um, find the people that you connect with um, and start talking about what, what can everyone contribute? We have a lot of expertise that we suppress in the face of, you know, in the face of, the, of, what, of what's going on. Women are really good at things. I, I mean, when I look at um, you know the Nobel Prize in economics this year and the recognition of, of female labor and often women there's kind of like the the you know the um, mommy uh, discount or deficit um, and you know in which you're any time away from a you know a paid employment is viewed as um, you know, a blank space on a resume which is absolute rubbish. I mean the kind of coordinating networking multitasking things that you do. I mean, the, the fact is, if you look down, you know, and look around and to your sides, there you have a whole fleet of experts right in your community. And I think the key is to be confident in your own expertise and recognizing that you learn along the way. 
I mean, one of the things I've always said is that I'm not afraid to be wrong and I'm not afraid to be told that I'm wrong. Once you get over that fear, just, I mean, dive in and learn because that's, that's how it's done. There's no, there's no kind of magic recipe that some people have and other people don't. We all, um, I mean, democracy demands participation. hundred percent. You're, you're singing the red, wine and blue song here. So, uh, and I can say for sure with my like local organizing had never done it before. We just did it. And we've learned so much along the way, but you're right. Like it's been life-changing. I have made friends with people I would never have met otherwise. So that, that kind of keep, that keeps you going. Um, I know people were dropping some questions in the chat. If you all have questions, can you please drop them in the chat now so we can ask those to Laura? Uh, one last thing I will ask is that, I mean, we've talked about how well-funded the, these, you know, extremist efforts are, um, but from what you saw across the country, um, would you put your money on them or would you put it on the local moms doing the work? And did you see the local moms, you know, being able to defeat um, some of these policies or a lot of these policies? Absolutely. And I think, I mean, I think Red Wine Blue got a head start and uh, not Red Wine Blue, uh, Moms for Liberty got a head start because um, I, I had a conversation with Liz Mkhitaryan, who started um, Stop Moms for Liberty in Brevard County. I was there about a month ago. And um, I asked her, I said, when I was down here in 2022, I didn't see a big Stop Moms for Liberty presence. And she said, we couldn't believe, we didn't think anybody would believe this stuff. So there was, a, they got a little bit of a head start. But what I have seen is since then is that all of these grassroots and, and national groups like Red Wine and Blue really taking off. And I mean, I think the Idaho was just a beautiful, I, I went to a meeting that had 150 people in this kind of, tim. it was a whole old timber town, a timbered town, you know, hall, 150 people volunteering that they were going to hold signs for the recall, that they were making t-shirts, that they were, I mean, people just showed up because they realized that it mattered. And um and I also think that another opportunity is don't be afraid to have conversations with people that you think may not agree with you. One of the interesting interviews that I had when I was doing that story is on election day, I met with this dad that I had arranged to um, talk with who on his Facebook page has the second amendment and the American flag, and he has eight children. And I met him at a coffee shop across from the uh, junior high school, and he had just voted. And he has six of his kids are in public school. And, you know, I, there was no need to discuss what his, you know, you know, political party affiliation was. And I said, I asked him about, you know, these claims of, you know, indoctrination and what was going on in schools. And he said, the idea that our teachers are indoctrinating our children, he said, is paranoid paranoid bull hunky. And he said, I, he builds pole barns. He wakes up every day at 4.30 a.m. to go work so that he can be done in the afternoon and attend his kids' sports practices. He said, if I am not there and I am not hearing what my kids are coming, of course they're going to come home with stuff that I disagree with. But if, but if I'm not present, why should I complain? I am, my job as a parent is to be involved and to have those conversations with them. And I think sometimes we forget how flimsy some of the arguments are of indoctrination or kids are being brainwashed. I mean, if you have a relationship with your children, I can't imagine anyone brainwashing any of my kids, you know, right underneath my nose. It just... Um, Parents have a lot of power and influence, and we have to be willing to um, call that out and recognize it and lift it up. All right, I'm going to see Angela was helping me to kind of get the questions together from the chat. So, Angela, were there any questions that you want to throw out here to Laura? Uh, there were there were a few. Um the first one was, it was an eye opener that outside people served as experts for bills that came up in committee who were suggesting what was, quote, best. Who was paying them? And what, 
or I maybe mean, he was like likely paying them for bills in in committee well I'm no i guess who was paying i think i think what she meant was um who who was paying these people who were serving as these experts um even though these are not, these are people from the outside where would where would they have been i guess who would have been paying for them to be there and be these experts i think she was talking about when you're talking about alex legislation oh, the and a lot of experts that get brought yeah. in to support the right wing legislation right yeah, i mean right I mean, the, the, I mean there are there are a lot of experts from you know I, I it's it's really hard without knowing the specific um bill or legislation but I mean I think what's clear is that I mean you see someone like Christopher Rufo right so Christopher Rufo um I'm working on a story now about um anti-dei laws um in higher ed and you know if he he you know is very clear that he is on a crusade to basically, um, and effectively so make DEI the new CRT. And he wrote and drafted with other people model legislation. And what are we seeing now across, around the country is this model legislation that is popping up. Um, so, I mean, there are all of these, these kind of Cato Institute, Goldwater Institute, these, these far right, um, you know, think tanks. I mean, if you look at their, you know, their 990s and filings, I mean, there's a lot of money there and they have fellows, right. Who are experts and they draft this legislation and it's, it doesn't, you know, I, I don't know about experts testifying. Um, you know, I've watched some, I've watched a lot of legislative sessions where people seem to come of their own accord, um, to testify in some of these things. Um, so I, I'm not clear on what you mean, but there is a lot of money. There is a lot of coordination. There is, um, you know, there are there are organizations that are corralling and sharing experts. I mean, if you look at Chris Rufo, he's connected to the Manhattan Institute. He's, um, you know, he's, uh, you know, he's on DeSantis's. He's suddenly DeSantis's um, advisor and helps craft, you know, not only it's not even just the legislation or the, but it's the agenda. Um, so you have influential people who are crafting these ag agendas and, you know, you can find, you know, follow some of them on Twitter and you can see what's going on. Um, and I think it's fair to say they have enough money and that there are experts who want to agree with them or who are doctors or lawyers and they have the same views. And so they go and support them. And, you know, we see a lot of even, um, right wing groups, and I'm sure Laura, you've seen this, is that they sound very official. They have official sounding names intentionally, right? So that when they put out research or polls or studies, they get quickly retweeted and shared, especially on right wing media. And these are, you know, organizations like pretending to be the AMA, but it's like 600 doctors who have very extreme views, and that's all they are. <laughs> and you know what's interesting is that, um, is it's it's like the red scare during the red scare you saw these kind of creations so there was a names that camouflaged their intent like so the national council for education was a far right group during the red scare and it sounds like the national education association and the american council on education but it's a fusion of just different words that sound official, but with a completely different intent. So you, I mean, it's like, beware, <laughs> beware of who, who the source is. Yeah, I think that's really important too, for all of us, as we are sharing things on social media and talking to friends, you know, for us to vet sources as well. But when you see people sharing things that just don't sound right, check out <laughs> the source, um, yeah. dig a little deeper into that. Angela, was there additional questions? Just a couple. Um, someone asks, I've heard about Moms for Liberty using aggressive and threatening behavior. Have you seen that? I have heard about it um, from moms on the ground. And, you, you know, I've watched school board meetings where it, it, indeed um, people are not on their best behavior and are, and are aggressive and mean. And um, 
I mean, sometimes when you dig into some of the attacks on social media and start tracing things, you find that there are, you know, very devious and, um, you know, and rude, dangerous. I mean, I've, uh, um, I, excuse me, I was uh, speaking with, um, I interviewed somebody who isn't in the book because she was so um, terrified, who was just attacked um, and left her job. And I interviewed her, she was a librarian and she in Texas, and she was looking for, I, I interviewed her um, in a hotel in June, 2022, when she was had just been on a job interview um, and was hoping that she was gonna land something. Um, that the, these attacks, I mean, librarians tell me about, you know, people going into the library, taking pictures and then posting, you know, we've all seen that and posting it on social media and threatening librarians that they're going to, and I mean, they've even called the sheriff and had people come to the libraries to arrest people for pornography. I mean, these, these are very real things that are happening. It's, 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 it's unconscionable, but people are, it is happening. Um, and, and really the last one that I think was not answered in the chat, because one of them I think was answered very fully in the chat was about the amount of money it now takes to run for school boards. <laughs> and the person said, it's just wild how much school board races have to spend any thoughts on how to better fundraise yeah i mean it is crazy i mean school boards and i mean that that harkens back to the patriot mobile action and as a result you're seeing a lot of far right money going into um uh, into school board races around the country so a group like um the 1776 project which was donald trump's kind of answer to the 1619 project morphed into um, a kind of, they also have a super PAC, which then started funding, um, uh, giving money to school board candidates. One of the things I think um, is, you know, it, it is really hard to battle when you have tens of thousands and 20,000 or a hundred thousand dollars going into school board races. I think the key is to, is to call that out to people because I don't think it makes anyone feel good when their local races are really being controlled by national groups. Um, in different states, I think it's really important to look at campaign um, finance filings. They're organized differently in different states. Um, I can tell you, Texas, they're pretty available and not hard to get. Pennsylvania, they're very hard to get. You have to uh, apparently go in person to get them. Um, but I think looking at like Transparency USA sometimes can offer in different states offers an idea of who's funding whom and and calling that out. I think social media is a really free, wonderful way to um, to connect people and let people know um, kind of what's up and to share. Uh, and also, I mean, there's nothing like knocking on doors, holding signs, I mean, doing the 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 work. I mean, that really pays off. Um, and making it personal, make make these races personal. This is about your school. This, you know, I, I wouldn't want some national group kind of dropping flyers and sending box trucks around my neighborhood to get me to vote for somebody that I don't know anything about. So I think it takes a lot of work. Um, and I think, uh, you know, obviously money helps and money is hard to fight, but I think money can be fought with labor. Absolutely. Well, we are bumping up on 830. So that is perfect timing on the questions, Angela. And so, Laura, I wanted to give you a chance just to kind of share a little bit about your book. I dropped a link to it in the chat, but um, where can people find it? And then also I will send an email afterwards with all of your social media in case people want to follow you, but where's the best, where do you, are you most active on social media or where's the best place to follow okay. your work? Um, I, you guys have scared me with Instagram, but I have figured out how to use it. Um, I, because as a journalist, I was always used Twitter, um, 
but um, I do have a website, laurapapano.com. And on that website, actually, um, there are kind of like buttons and there is more information about the book. There is also, um, I have been doing a really good job of keeping, noting all the events that I'm having, both in person and the ones that have been online or radio or TV and putting links to them in there. If anybody wants to kind of watch or listen, there's a lot of stuff there um, and there's more to come. I'm traveling some more um, coming up and hoping to see people. I ran into some red wine and blue people when I was in DC. I was, uh, I guess it was Galentine's day and they came running over to the bookstore, which was great. Um, so that the best way to find me are those places. And, you know, my emails there, Laura, laurapapano.com. Um, and people do get in touch with me all the time. Well, that's great. I will be sure to send out, uh, Laura graciously sent me links to all of her social media. And then I forgot that the chat does not let you highlight links. <laughs> so I tried <laughs> to drop them all and I'm like, that's not showing up. Um, so I will send those in an email, which will highlight the link. So we will do that. And yes, we were very excited. I think several of our members in different states have run into you. And I think you were at, um, what is it? Poets and pro. What is it in DC? Uh, politics and prose. Politics, politics and prose in DC. And then I was in Doylestown and I'm going to be in New Haven. Then I'm going to be in Newtonville books next Wednesday outside of Boston. And, you know, they're having some um, challenges um, and that's, I used to live in Newton. So I appreciate, you know, that battle. Well, we appreciate you, all the research you did. We appreciate you going to the conventions and doing everything you did, because that must've been very interesting. So, uh, excited to read the book and we appreciate you coming on and sharing your wisdom that you've learned by, through this journey. So hope everybody has a really great evening and we will uh, see you soon.